So here now the very word of God as it is given to us in the Gospel of John, reading from the 18th chapter, verses 29 through 32. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. And may the Lord bless this reading of his word to our understanding this evening. Let's ask him for that illumination. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your word because we know that this is indeed your word. And that as your word, it is truth, every single jot and tittle of it. And so we pray that this truth will be manifested to us tonight, will take hold in our lives, and that we will recognize the, the back and forth here, and, and that we will see uh, in the words the, the, the amazing evil that is intended and the amazing good that results, and we will give you the glory for that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. One of the great themes of Scripture, and it's something that we see throughout Scripture, is how God continually turns tragedy into triumph, and how through from the very beginning to the very end, evil continually tries to thwart or subvert the will of God, and how over and over again this simply backfires, and the exact opposite of what evil intends is what happens. We have a great example of this in the, uh, the book of Genesis, the story of Joseph. Uh, Joseph, talking to his brothers, says this, as for you, you meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good. And that's a great example of exactly what I'm talking about. You see, the brothers of Joseph had evil intent. Everything that they intended to do with Joseph was evil. They threw him in a pit. They stripped him. They sold him as a slave to the Midianites. They took his coat, covered it in animal blood, and then presented it to their father as if Joseph had been killed. And then watched their own father mourn almost to death. It was so torn up about losing Joseph. That's evil, folks. I mean, can you believe that these are the patriarchs of our faith? I mean, what a great example of grace that is. But nonetheless, even though they meant it for evil, God turned it around the entire story for good. But that, that wasn't the end of it, you see, because, you know, Joseph got sold to a man named Potiphar, and you know the story. Potiphar's wife took a shine to Joseph and tried to seduce him, and Joseph wouldn't have anything to do with it, and she accused him of inappropriate behavior, if not out-and-out out rape, and he got thrown in jail. She meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Now, while he's in jail, he meets some guys who are actually going to ultimately introduce him to Pharaoh. And through that, Pharaoh's going to recognize his strength and his power by, and, uh, by the way God works in him. And he's going to rise to the number two man in all of Egypt. And through Joseph, the family is going to be saved. They're going to have a special place within, within Egypt. They're going to grow into a mighty nation. God is going to work this entire our gorgeous redemption through them and take them ultimately back to the promised land to fulfill the covenant that he made with Abraham. So through a whole sequence of evil, people who meant things for evil, God turns around to good. And that's what we're going to see in our little text tonight. The greatest evil that humanity has ever done is to send the Son of God to the cross. But the greatest good resulted from that evil. 
And that's the story that we're going to see as we turn our attention to this, uh, this piece of text. Now, those of you who have been here over the years know that we have this very strange series that goes on here on Good Friday. And that is that every year we take a little episode of the occurrences, the events on Good Friday. Now, we've, we've sort of taken the Gospels and we do this as linearly, chronologically as we can. We are working our way through this momentous day and we're using the same time designation that the Hebrews did. In other words, we're not starting our day at midnight, but rather at dusk the day before. So Friday to them actually started Thursday at, at dusk. So that puts Jesus and his disciples in the upper room enjoying that final Passover when this sacrament was instituted. And then, of course, that beautiful and wonderful upper room discourse and the high priestly prayer. But the day kind of begins when they leave, sing a hymn. They descend down through the Kidron Valley and into the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's where the action sort of begins. And so we've been through that over the years. We have been through that process. We have seen the prayers that Jesus had in the garden. We have seen Judas come and betray him. We have seen Jesus' arrest, the fracas in the garden. We have seen the trials that resulted first with Annas and then with Caiaphas, the kangaroo court, if you will, the legal one that they did in the middle of the night and then we saw that rubber stamp court that the Sanhedrin held literally at the crack of dawn and that's all occurred and Jesus has been condemned and now bound they have taken him to the governor's house and then we saw perhaps the most extraordinary case of hypocrisy you will ever see as these legalistic Jews, and I kind of think Caiaphas was with them, although we're not told, he's the high priest. But anyway, as they refuse to go into Pilate's house because they don't want to get Gentile dust on their feet because they want to eat their Passover meal. Now they're there to kill the Son of God, but they're worried about dust on their feet. Uh, but nonetheless, that's where they are standing outside of the governor's house. Now last year we backed up a little bit because some of these events are occurring simultaneously. So we backed up and we saw Judas returned the 30 pieces of silver and the Sanhedrin's harsh reaction to that. Jews, of course, committing suicide. But we talked about the idea of selective ignorance that was going on with these perpetrators of Jesus' arrest and now his condemnation. So when we pick this up, where we are in the action of the event is Jesus and some members from the Sanhedrin are standing outside the governor's house. They've already woke him up. It is the crack of dawn. They have condemned Jesus, and now they have an agenda. And their agenda is going to come out in our text for this evening. So let's kind of dive into it and get started with it. Now, look in the 29th verse of this 18th chapter of John. So Pilate went outside to them. Now let's just kind of stop there. Because if we keep this up, it means that Pilate is probably going to be in the narrative for the next 10 years at least. Um, so we need to get to know him a little bit uh, uh, because he's, he's very prevalent in these. And John doesn't tell us anything about him. In fact, he almost acts as if we should know who Pilate is. He just comes out. He doesn't explain anything about him. And this is actually the first place in the Gospels where Pilate enters the narrative. Now, now Luke has referred to him a couple of times, but only from an historical uh, perspective, like Pilate was the governor when these things happened. This is the first time that he actually enters the narrative. So, Let's, let's do a little historical sketch of Pilate because we need to understand his moral character to a degree and we also need to understand why 
the Jews seem to be so antagonistic with him. There, there's no love lost here. We want to kind of understand why that is. Now, none of the Gospels really give us much of a history as far as Pilate is concerned. So we're going to step out of the Gospels real quick and go and, and look at some of the writings of, of, of historians of the day. Historians like Philo or Josephus or Tacitus or Eusebius, these guys. They tell us a little bit about Pilate. Apparently, he was born in Spain uh, and grew up there, and then he served in the Roman army in, um, in, in Gaul, which, of course, is modern-day France. But eventually, he made his way to Rome, and, and that's where he met his wife uh, and married her, Claudia Procula. Now, Claudia apparently was connected. She was of noble birth. Uh, at least that's what most scholars think. They, they, it seems that Claudia was the daughter of Julia, and Julia was the daughter of Caesar Augustus. So that's part of the connection that Pilate had. But I don't know that that is such a great designation. Because Julia... She was kind of famous in her own right. And, and I'll just use the words that I, I read about her. She was a stunning reprobate. Now, I don't know how you get to be a stunning reprobate, but I do know that her lasciviousness, her sensuality, and her immorality was legend. So much so that her own father, Caesar Augustus, said one time, I wish I could disown her. Uh, I wish she wasn't my daughter. So, therefore, I don't know that this is the great designation. But nonetheless, more than likely, Claudia is the reason that a man like Pilate, who has obvious um, character flaws, was made the governor of Judea. Not that being the prefect or the governor of Judea was all that great of an appointment because actually it was considered to be hard duty because this was a people of religious fanatics who would just as, as, as well die for their faith than to bend the knee to Rome. And so they, 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 they had a certain problem that a man like Pilate was just not up to that challenge. He was the classic little big man. And, and, and a little big man, a little man with a big job. And, and, and when a little big man finds himself in a situation where he needs to show real strength and authority, quite often he will lapse into cruelty. And that's what, that's what Pilate had done. This is the reason that there's such animosity with the Jews. And let me just give you one example. There are many examples of how he just made a mess of things. One particular example is my favorite. Uh, it's, it's that he was constantly bringing idols into Jerusalem. And one of the ways that he did it one time was to bring Roman standards and put them all around town. Now, a standard, besides just being a, you know, a symbol of Rome, had an image of Caesar. Now, they worshiped Caesar as a god. So, in reality, what he had done was to scatter idols all over God's holy city. Well, the Jews, of course, are not going to put up with that. And so they staged a sit-in outside his headquarters there. And, and they said, we're not leaving until you take those idols down. Well, after a while, Pilate got sick of them, and he said, if you don't leave, I'm going to send my soldiers out into the midst and lop off all of your heads. And what the Jews did was to lie down and stretch out their necks and say, go ahead. <laughs> you know, give it your best shot because if you take our heads there's going to be a whole bunch of people here tomorrow and you're going to have a real mess on your hands and Pilate had to back down now on other occasions he did resort to violence and, and a ma in fact it was such a massacre that was his downfall and it really actually wasn't with the Jews it was with the Samaritans a group of worshipers heading up Mount Gerizim to worship unarmed and peaceful he had his soldiers massacre them completely and of course that found that made its way to his boss who was the legate of Syria even though he answered directly to Pi to um, Caesar he was under the authority of the Syrian legate who deposed him and sent him back to Rome, much to his unfortunate, uh, 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 his 
unfortunate or misfortune, Tiberius, who was his um, benefactor, died when he was in route. So we don't know what ultimately happened to Pilate. Um, some people say he was executed as soon as he got back to Rome. Other people say he was exiled along with Claudia. But whatever happened, we see that his career ended in disgrace. So that kind of gives you an idea of Pilate and the troubles that he has with the Jews. Now, that's going to kind of give us an idea about the tension or the terseness of the dialogue that follows. Now, it seems like at least he's beginning to learn his lesson a little bit because we read here that Pilate went out to them. They come and knock on his door literally at the, at the crack of dawn. And Pilate, rather than saying, hey, I'm the governor. If you want to talk to me, you come into my office. He knew that that was going to lead to trouble. So at least he looks like he's learning his lesson a little bit. He goes outside and he talks to the people about Jesus. Now, Notice what he says as the verse 29 continues. He asks them a question. What accusation do you bring against this man? Now that seems on the surface like a perfectly legitimate question, doesn't it? I mean, Pilate is the governor. He is going to be asked to make a judgment about this man. So basically, it seems like it would be a perfectly normal thing for him to ask, well, what has he done? What has he done wrong? And in particular, what has he done wrong that would be breaking Roman law? Because obviously you have brought him to me for a Roman solution. So what has he done? Well, notice the way that the Jews answer him. I think this is very interesting. Look, look, look at the, um, the verse 30. Um, he says, what accusation do you bring against this man? And the Jews say, they answered him, if this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Now, doesn't that seem a little bit impudent uh, on their part? I, I mean, if you're there to ask somebody, and by the way, they have a very specific agenda that they really want to get uh, uh, accomplished. So it seems like that's the wrong way to go about it. They want Pilate to do them a favor. So why do you think that they answered so harshly, so impudently, if, if you will? Well, we're not told, so I can't tell you for sure. But I, I, I want to give you my opinion. I want to give you my conjecture. It is pure conjecture, so this is not in Scripture, but it is an educated guess. I think that there's a double cross that has gone on here. I think that they were expecting Pilate to simply take Jesus and crucify him with no questions asked. In fact, I almost think that that was a prearranged scenario that the Jews were expecting and that when they come up and Pilate says... So what did this man do wrong? It really caught them off guard, and that's why they answered the way that they did. Now, why would I say that? Well, if we staying in the 18th chapter there of John, if we go back to the third verse of that chapter, when uh, Judas is bringing the entourage into the garden, here's what it says. Judas then, having received the Roman cohort... And officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees came with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Okay? Well, no mystery that he's got the officers of the chief priests in the temple. But do you know how many men are in a Roman cohort? 420. Okay? It, it, I mean, it varies here and there. And whether or not there were 420 men that were there, that's a large number of Romans that Judas brought with him. And I can guarantee you that there was not a, 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 a cohort that was sent for a, a local problem that did not have to have the governor's approval. So obviously there's been some conversation before this. Obviously they have gone to Pilate and they have said there is a revolutionary planning a revolution in the Garden of Gethsemane. We need a major force to go and get him, to go and take care of these rebellions or else you're going to have a big problem on your hands. Now again, that's pure conjecture, but it would make sense. Why do you think that they would have asked for so many men for just what they were uh, facing. 
It's because they have an agenda, and we'll get to that in a moment. But nonetheless, that's the reason I think that there's some kind of a double cross or, 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 or something that the Jews did not expect, and that's the way that they respond the way that they do. Well, n notice the way that, that um, Pilate responds. Uh, by the way, there, there's sort of a back and forth here. We're not going to get all the way into it this year. We'll get into it next year. But there, there's a back and forth that's very dramatic. I mean, the, the Jews are outside. Jesus comes inside. And Pilate is going to go back and forth between the, them both. And, and so there's a very high, tense, terse drama that is going on here. Well, anyway... Look in the 31st verse after they give this impudent response. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. Now, I want you to notice, let's go back to that verse j just for a moment, uh, the one that we just saw. Notice that all that the Jews actually say about Jesus is an ad hominem attack. Okay, they don't give any accusations. They don't tell Pilate what he's done wrong. They just sent, they simply say he's an evildoer and, and, and we've judged him. And so therefore you just need to do what you're supposed to do. Take him and kill him and that's all we want you to do because we've already determined that he's an evildoer. Now, again, total conjecture. But the way I see this is Pilate just kind of goes like this and says, uh-huh. <laughs> and, and he doesn't budge because Luke is going to tell us that they started coming forth with all kinds of accusations then, not just the ad hominem one. If you want to stick your finger there and move back to Luke uh, in the 23rd chapter, the second verse, this is what we will read. And they began to accuse him saying, we found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Now, three accusations they make against Jesus. So after the Pilate first says no and then it's obvious that he's not going to budge, then they start making accusations. Now, some of these accusations are, are, are out and out lies. Other are, are sort of twisted and slanted, but they all have one purpose in mind. And that is to get Pilate now involved to see Jesus as public enemy, number one. First thing they say about Jesus is that he's misleading the nation. <laughs> they don't tell him how he's misleading the nation or how he's trying to lead the nation. Basically, what Jesus wants to do is lead the nation out of apostasy back to a relationship with God. But they don't say that. They say, they, they give the impression that he's a revolutionary that's plotting some kind of an overthrow of the government. This would definitely be something that Rome would be interested in. The second thing they say about him is that he has prohibited us to pay tribute to Caesar. Now, that is definitely something that the Romans are going to perk up about because it's their entire program, their entire expansion depended on taxes. That, uh, that's how they made their money, and that's why they kept on growing and growing and growing because they wanted to conquer more places so they could charge more taxes so they could make more money and become more opulent and so therefore that that was an obvious lie because we know from Luke that when the Herodians came to Jesus and they asked him should we pay taxes to Caesar what did Jesus say render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and render to God the things that are God Jesus never said don't pay taxes to Caesar and then the final thing that they said was that he claims to be the Christ. He claims to be the king. Now that also would have really caused Pilate to perk up. Because keep in mind, we understand that God's Messiah was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But that's not the way Pilate would have heard about the Messiah. Because the Jews expected the Messiah to be a military and a political leader who was going to take them out from under the yoke of Rome and throw off their oppression. So anyone, according to Pilate's understanding, who claimed to be the Messiah was actually a traitor committing treason against Caesar. And of course, you remember, once we get into that trial, that's exactly what he's going to ask Jesus is, okay... 
are you a king, right? So they've been very effective in sort of maneuvering a pilot into a corner. Okay, so there's this chess game that's going on. Pilot is a pretty shrewd operator. And, and so he comes right back at him. And basically, he says, still, no matter what you say, this man has not committed any crime against the Roman government that I can tell. And that pretty much is going to fashion the way that he's going to go at this. So let's go back to John. Let's reread that, that next verse that I kind of jumped ahead on. Pilate said to them, take him yourself and judge him by your own law. That is exactly what they were expecting uh, or he wanted them to do. Now, I can't help but think that even though Pilate wants this whole thing to go away, and of course his wife later on is going to have a dream and tell him to have nothing to do with this man, but I, I, I think there's some kind of an inner conflict that, that goes on with Pilate here. I think there's a degree of intellectual curiosity about Jesus. Because there, there's one thing that is absolutely clear to him, and that's that these Jews hate him. <laughs> they hate the ground he walks on. And more than likely, Pilate hates the Jews and, and, and hates them right back. So... Why do they hate this other man, this Jesus? Why do they hate him more than they hate me? Perhaps the old adage comes in here, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. But he, he kind of has this interest. He wants to know what it is about Jesus that has made these men hate him so much that they would come and grovel to him. Now, he knows that they're envious of Jesus. He knows that. He also probably knows that the revolution in the Garden of Gethsemane was a bust. Okay? So they found nothing but a bunch of ragtag disciples who all ran away into the darkness. And Jesus actually came peacefully. So that didn't uh, occur. So why would they stay up all night? He probably knows enough about Jewish law to know that having a midnight trial like they did was absolutely illegal according to their laws. So what is it about this man that they hate so much that they would come and try to force this situation on us? So he says, hey, take them and try them by your own laws. Well, the Jews are pretty shrewd themselves. In fact, they're going to prove to be better maneuverers than Pilate because they're going to outmaneuver him in this entire scenario. But notice what they say next in the second half of verse 31. The Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. And that's absolutely right. Somewhere around 6 AD to 30 AD, the Jews lost the ability to perform capital punishment, to execute someone who had broken the law in some way that required death. And the Old Testament is filled with those kinds of laws. But that was something that the Romans wanted for themselves. They, they, you know, they, they used crucifixion and other kinds of death as a deterrent. So they wanted to keep the peace, a peace that was based on terror, but it was peace nonetheless because peace brought prosperity and prosperity brought taxes. And that's what they were about. So, therefore, um, there's, uh, there's, uh, they, they had taken away the, the, the right for, uh, for capital punishment. Well, if you're paying attention, you might ask the question, well, what about Stephen? Didn't they kill Stephen? And, and, and didn't this just happen a couple of months down the road? And wasn't Pilate still the governor when they killed Stephen? And how come they got away with that? Well, first of all, the answer to that is that that was mob violence, and this is capital punishment. This is an execution, a punishment for a wrongdoing. And so, therefore, it was definitely unlawful for them to do it. But that raises an even more important question. We're starting to get to the core of this now. Why did the Jews enlist the Romans at all? Why didn't they just stir up a mob like they did with Stephen? How come, I mean, later on today, they're going to stir up a mob. They're going to show that they can do it very easily. Probably they're already working at it. Where the same people who cried Hosanna just a couple of days ago are now going to cry crucify him. Let his blood be upon us and our children. 
Okay? They're, they're good at stirring up mobs. So why didn't they stir up a mob and have them go into the Garden of Gethsemane and kill them and be done with it? Why didn't they send just a group of assassins in there? Because we know all the disciples are asleep. Jesus is the only one that is awake. They could have slipped in there. They could have slit everyone's throat and been gone in a few minutes. And the entire situation would be over. Why did they go and bring the Romans into this? And why are they now at Pilate's door insisting that Pilate kills Jesus? Well, we learned the answer to that. In the next verse, verse 32. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. And it is the kind of death that comes into play now. There are two perspectives, brothers and sisters. They both want the same thing. And this is what's so extraordinary about this. There is evil and then there is God. There is evil and there is good, and both of them want Jesus to die on a cross. Crucifixion is the chosen method, and both of them want that to happen. Okay, Both have their own perspectives. Let's look at the perspective of evil first. You see, the reason that the Sanhedrin is there and insistent that Pilate takes Jesus and crucify him is because they, it's not enough to kill Jesus. They have to kill his name. They have to kill the fact that he has claimed to be the Messiah and he has authenticated that through his mighty works and deeds. In other words, he's proven beyond a shadow of a doubt to the people that he is the son of God. He's exactly who he said he was. So somehow, the way that they kill Jesus, it cannot just be a quick and dirty killing. They have to some way kill him in a way that will mean you couldn't possibly be the Messiah. And of course, crucifixion was tailor-made for them. It was exactly what they wanted. So Jesus has to die on a cross. And the reason for that we find in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 21, two verses. This is what it says. And if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day. Here's the operative phrase. For a hanged man is cursed by God. And so in other words, what they needed was for Jesus in a public sense publicly seen by all the people to be hung on a tree to die that torturous death so that everyone would see he could not possibly be the Messiah. Because a Messiah would never die on a tree that way. And you know, to this day, Orthodox Jews will not believe in Jesus because he died on a tree. He died with the curse of God upon him. And therefore, he could not possibly be the Messiah in the way that they look at that. So we see the evil intent. They went there with an evil agenda. And you know something? These men, and I know that some of them are actually eventually probably going to come to know the Lord. They're going to be regenerated. But at this particular time, their leader is Satan. And their mindset re reflects the mindset of evil, the mindset of Satan. Jesus has told us all about that back in the 8th chapter of John. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him when he lies. He speaks out of his own character, for he's a liar and the father of lies. But... So, so what they're doing is not just their own accord. Yes, it is their nature. It is their intent. But it is also the intent of evil. In fact, you can almost hear Satan in the background cackling, can't you? You should have taken my offer back in the desert. 
You should have let me give you all these kingdoms of the world. I offered them to you and you refused. And now I'm going to destroy you. Now I'm going to nail you to a cross. And when I nail you to that cross, no one is going to believe that you're the Messiah. And you will die and your desire will die with you. You see, this is the, the mindset of evil. And, and, and sometimes I think we give Satan too much credit. You, you know, we think he's omniscient. He's not. We think he's omnipresent. He's not. And in fact, he is, he is controlled by his nature. He, he's, he's got the nature. Yes, he's a brilliant being. He knows us better than we know ourselves. But he keeps making the same mistakes over and over again, acting according to his evil nature. And he runs smack dab into the middle of God's providence. The devil means it for evil. But the devil is a brilliant, evil fool because he keeps making the same mistakes over and over again. He is so predictable. He will never learn. He will continue to seek the evil perspective because he honestly, in his maniacally deluded mind, thinks that one day he actually will defeat God. And so he continues to try to thwart whatever he does. The thief comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. All he can do is destroy. And so that was his purpose. And he honestly believes that if he can nail Jesus to the cross, Jesus is done for. That's the perspective of evil. The greatest evil will backfire and bring about the greatest good. So let's back up and let's take a look at the same thing from God's perspective this time. Let's take a look at that verse again. Because from God's perspective, it's totally different. But it still includes Jesus going to the cross. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. Okay? Now, Jesus had been telling his disciples, I am going to Jerusalem and I am going to die on a cross. Back in the 20th chapter of Matthew, they will deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. He will be raised on the third day in the 26th chapter of Matthew. You know that after two days the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Brothers and sisters, something is extraordinary here. Jesus went to the cross because it was ordained by God. It was, it was the cross that Jesus had to go to as far as God's plan was concerned. He doesn't have to be the author of evil. He doesn't have to tell Satan what to do. Satan is always going to act according to his fallen nature. And those who follow him will do exactly the same thing. God doesn't force Satan to do what he has to do. But Satan falls right into God's providence. Because God is the one who ordained the cross. Peter made this clear in his great Pentecost sermon, didn't he? When he says this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. He turns around and says you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. You see what the Sanhedrin doesn't recognize is that Jesus is not the kind of Messiah that they were expecting. Jesus has come because he will be that sacrificial substitutionary atonement. And so therefore the cross was his destination from the very beginning, from all eternity past. It was going to be the cross where he is going to be. He is the, the, the greatest evil is going to turn out into the greatest good. Because it is there on that cross that sins will be forgiven and atoned for. And God's wrath will be poured out upon him. You see, Paul tells us about this. Paul tells us why this happens. In Galatians 3, he says this, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So why do you think that the devil and the Sanhedrin miss this? What is it that they, that they, they fall into? It, it, to them, everything depends on Jesus being hung on that cross, being nailed on that cross. 
But you see, what they didn't understand is that Jesus, the one who knew no sin, would become sin for us. And God would pour his wrath out upon him and he would be that curse on the cross. And because of his curse, we are saved, we are forgiven, we are set free. Now, I can't tell you exactly why it had to be the cross. It has something to do with the three hours of holy darkness and who knows what actually happened during that period of time as God pours his wrath out upon Jesus. But it is something that was definite. Jesus asked in the Garden of Gethsemane, if there's any way that this can pass by me, we can find another way to do this, let's do it. And God did not change. And it also was something that explained something that had happened centuries before that had puzzled the commentators forever about what on earth this meant. And I'm talking about going back into the desert where the people are being bitten by venomous snakes, fiery snakes, fiery serpents, and and representing the impact that sin has on people. And what did God tell Moses to do? Make a brazen serpent and put it up on a pole. And anyone who looks upon that symbol of cursedness will be saved. What on earth does that mean? That sounds like idolatry until Jesus comes along in the third chapter of John and tells us what it's all about. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. (laughs) Do you see? Jesus had to become the curse because when we look upon him and believe on him with our sins upon him and God pouring his wrath out upon those sins, that's how we're saved. Because he was raised up just like the servant in the desert. Brothers and sisters, when we take this communion in a few minutes, that's what it represents. Jesus did not just die for us in some torturous way. He became sin for us. He who knew no sin took our sins upon him and God poured his wrath out upon him. He voluntarily became the curse For us. And that is the very core of our salvation. So yeah, I hope you can see that the evil intent of the Sanhedrin insisting that Jesus go to the cross, they are falling right into the providence of God. And so brothers and sisters, before we take this communion, I just want to share with you that evil will always act according to its nature. God does not have to tell evil what to do. Evil will always attempt to thwart the will of God. And sometimes when we are confronted with evil, we think that God has kind of gone to sleep. When we see such a heinous evil, as we saw a week or so ago up in Nashville where, where nine-year-old girls who go to school happy are, are going to be shot by a, a deranged individual and three staff members for no reason whatsoever. That is evil. And we ask, God, where were you when that evil occurred? Well, guess what? <laughs> Nothing happens in this universe That God is not aware of and God is in the business of turning evil into good. We don't know how it's going to look. We don't know how it's going to be. But we do know one thing. God is good and he will turn whatever evil can put forward into good. In fact, evil will backfire on those who perpetrate it. Because God takes their evil and he turns it into the greatest good. I don't care what kind of evil befalls you brothers and sisters. It will not be as evil as the story we just read. That is the greatest evil that humanity could ever possibly uh, uh, do. And that's to send the Son of God to the cross. Willingly, knowingly, maliciously, and evilly. If that's even a word. There is no greater evil that can ever occur, and God turned it into the greatest good that could ever occur. Your salvation, my salvation, your righteousness, my righteousness, your eternity, my eternity, 
God's glory, Christ's glory, all of it accomplished when Jesus went to the cross. That, brothers and sisters, is why we celebrate the crucifixion. Let's pray. Our dear Lord, we are so grateful that you're in charge and we're not because we, we would never be able to understand all of this. It just seems so strange now looking back on it that these, these great scholars of the Bible, they never seem to turn to Isaiah 53 and read the kind of Messiah that you had sent and, and what your intentions were. But they didn't and... We see their evil used by you to accomplish your good. And we know that even though we see evil all around us, and sometimes we're overwhelmed by that evil, we know, Lord, we trust in you, and we know that some way, eventually, you turn everything into the good because you are a good God, and you are in control, and we give you the glory. And we pray that you will bless this time that we turn to this table, that it might be for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.